So, you know, I, I never know sort of who here is a patient, who's a family member, who might be a caregiver, or actually a, a provider, but um, I assume everyone knows that they're here for the, the mouth, the oral, um, graft versus host disease oral health session. So um, I'll try and make this sort of as, as interesting and relevant for, for everyone here. Um, this will not be a really high-level technical talk um, like I would give if it was a room full of providers. Um, but even then, I always try and make things, you know, as sort of, you know, tangible as under and understandable as possible. I also don't want to, you know, talk about anything that's going to make anyone, you know, too upset or, or, or be, um, you know, scary. But at the same time, I do want to talk about some of the real, you know, things that can happen and um, some of the things that we can actually do to hopefully, you know, prevent or minimize uh, complications, especially as uh, time goes on. You know, first and foremost, and I'll, and I'll show you this in, in the next slide, the, the mouth is one of the most commonly affected sites with graft versus host disease. So anyone in this room who's experienced or is experiencing graft versus host disease, it's very common, very likely that the mouth has been affected to some extent. Um, it, it, it might be the first place where it, where it presents. It may persist when other areas tend to sort of quiet down or respond to other treatments. And it also may be an area that persists for years afterwards, even when somebody's able to be taken off of systemic immunosuppression. So I've got some patients that I'm, I'm following now 15, even 20 years after transplant that still have like active enough disease that we have to actively treat it. Um, it's symptomatic without management. Like graft versus host disease affecting any part of the body, there's not sort of a one size package. You know, somebody who has graft versus host disease of the eyes, you know, that some of you will hear about or graft host disease of the skin. You know, everybody doesn't experience the same thing. In some cases, it might be something that's sort of, you know, it's there, doctors noticed it, or, you know, the patients notice something feels a little bit different in the mouth, but for the most part, they're able to, you know, eat, drink, do everything, you know, have, have a normal life. Other patients, you know, it can be so debilitating that there's, you know, significant weight loss, um, you know, significant um, uh, reduction in quality of life just because things as simple as you know, being able to drink water um, actually becomes uncomfortable. Uh, the lichenoid inflammation, this term, if, if any of you have heard, is a term that we use to describe sort of the most typical pattern of inflammation that we see clinically in the mouth, but also it's used to describe uh, inflammation patterns on the skin. Um, I don't remember if somebody's talking about uh, um, uh, you know, genital mucosa, but especially in well, men and women, the same type of pattern that we can see um, on that tissue. And so it has in the mouth this sort of very distinct sort of red and white type of pattern to it, and in particular the white pattern that most people are aware of. Um, it's actually considered a diagnostic criteria. We see somebody with these very characteristic features in the mouth, which I'll show you. We can actually make a diagnosis of graft versus host disease um, based on that alone. Um, the lips are very often affected, and I point that out here in this first slide just because the, with graft versus host disease, the lips are really sort of part of the mouth, much more than part of the skin. You know, it's sort of this area where we sort of leave the mouth and get to skin. Um, but interestingly, it tends to be active in association with the mouth, um, whereas it may sort of, you know, stop right at the edge of the lips, and the skin of the face may not be affected at all. And I'll, we'll talk about a little bit about that and how we manage it. Dry mouth is another really um, important feature of graft versus host disease um, and how it affects the, the mouth and, um, and oral cavity. So the salivary glands, you know, we don't, we don't see, we sort of take, um, take for granted, I think, most of the time. But we have major salivary glands that are sort of here in the cheek, um, underneath, um, underneath the, uh, the mandible as well, sort of under the tongue. Um, and these get targeted um, by the graft versus host disease, actually very similar to the way that the glands of the eyes can be targeted. And it causes basically um, uh, changes in the saliva, but also decreased saliva. And this can cause um, some significant problems in the mouth, in particular increasing the risk of cavities. So I'm, I'm sort of laying the groundwork for a lot of things that we'll talk about more specifically in just a minute, but this is um, obviously a Im important area where we can actually do a lot to help prevent um, complications and eventually prevent tooth loss. Um, and then finally, and this is something that, you know, I never want to put too much emphasis on, but it is important to be aware of. I mean, anyone who, you know, has any involvement with a, with a patient with graft host disease in the mouth, Really, anybody who has, you know, who's, who's managing, dealing with a patient who has any history of graft versus host disease is unfortunately there is this increased risk of cancer just related to um, the history of the graft versus host disease, the treatments for the graft versus host disease, 
and the mouth is one of the, new, the most high-risk sites. So what that means is that this is still a very low-risk event from the standpoint of anyone who's gone through transplant, even someone who's had very active graft resource disease in the mouth, the likelihood of developing cancer is still very low, but compared to the general population, it's actually very high. It's just that when you have risks that are very low, the relative risk, sometimes it's hard to sort of reconcile in, in someone's head. So nobody should consider that they're at very high risk for cancer, but again, it's something that we always want to be aware of so that if there's changes, we can actually identify um, and do something early. So I had mentioned that the mouth is one of the most common sites. This is, this is data that's been um, reported for many years now. There's actually um, updated data as well, but it really hasn't changed at all, so I, I like to refer back to more classic work. Um, and what this shows is um, the, the areas of involvement and the, and the proportion of patients with involvement. And what you can see is that, like I had said before, skin and mouth are the two most frequently affected, and these are upwards in 80 to 90% of patients, so really very common. And then as we get to other areas, they tend to be sort of less frequently affected, although, again, in a, in a large population of patients with graft versus host disease, we see a combination of you know, all these areas being affected. So with the mouth, and, and similar to the way graft versus host disease is really anywhere in the body, it, it resembles other diseases that we otherwise see. So in my sort of non-transplant, non-cancer population, I see patients with a condition called lichen planus, which is very common. Um, and it really looks almost identical to the way chronic graft versus host disease will look in the mouth with this sort of pattern of lycodite inflammation. So um, I talked about these white sort of lacy changes, um, oftentimes red changes as well. And then this is all an ulceration. Um, ulcers tend to be very painful. So some of you may be familiar with, you know, a canker sore, you know, a tiny little, maybe the size of like, you know, the back of a pencil eraser, and that can cause really significant pain. You imagine this is, you know, this is all ulceration. So um, can be, a, you know, could potentially be a very uncomfortable condition. Uh, Sjogren syndrome, it's an autoimmune condition that, that affects the salivary glands and the glands of the eyes, the lacrimal glands. Um, again, in the context of this, we see a, a condition that almost exactly resembles it. Um, and then scleroderma, Again, a potentially very serious autoimmune condition um, that also can have the same type of effects with graft versus host disease um, affecting the skin, the tissues sort of under the skin, but sometimes the skin around the face and the neck, and sometimes even inside the mouth we see um, that same type of sort of tightening and fibrosis. Not very common, but I will talk about it a little bit towards the end. Um, so with all the potential ways in which the mouth can be affected, it can have potentially a, a, a quite profound impact on quality of life. You know, simple things like being able to um, eat, eat comfortably, drink, um, brush your teeth, um, you know, just you know, basic activities where it can, where it can impact. Um, and, and importantly, the mouth oftentimes um, not only may not respond as well to systemic therapies as other areas might, but really it just, it responds very well to more local sort of focused um, localized therapies. So whenever possible, we really try to, um, to, to, to take advantage of, of you know, the various um, treatment modalities that we have. And these are just some clinical images, just to sort of orient everybody again. So here again, we see these typical sort of white lacy changes. In some cases, it can get actually quite thick. It almost looks like it's um, like a plaque-like formation. Um, you can see how the lips are very prominently affected here. Um, but really just to the edges of the lips. Um, and and the, how sites are affected can vary tremendously. So I may see one patient and they have very prominent involvement of the palate. I may see another patient that has very prominent involvement of the cheeks, but no involvement of the palate. And we really don't, we have no idea why one area gets targeted more than another. Um, another common feature, um, which I'll talk about a little bit um, when I talk about the salivary gland component, are these um, mucoceles or little sort of spit bubbles that'll pop up on the roof of the mouth. And any of you that have you know, experienced this condition have probably experienced this to some extent. Um, this is related to minor salivary gland tissue that's actually all throughout the mouth. Um, and these can get sort of plugged and inflamed and cause these little um, blisters of saliva. They don't actually tend to be very painful, but they can, they can be um, pretty alarming when they're all over the place. Um, again, we, see, we saw this in the other picture, but another example where we have this sort of focal area of ulceration, 
um, in the cheek or what we call the buccal mucosa. Uh, and then, you know, surrounded by these very prominent red and white changes. And again, just you can see, you know, very similar involvement in, with the tongue, um, but also the lips. I've, I've almost said this, I think, verbatim already, but I, I like to include this quote because it was, um, you know, written sort of in the early days when sort of some of the first literature was first coming out describing um, graphers host disease in detail. And, um, and this was from the, the group in Seattle. Um, Dr. Schubert is um, an oral medicine specialist, someone I've, I've known for many years and, and still sees patients there. Um, but, you know, they said, well, oral lesions are most common in patients with extensive chronic GVHD. So that means where, you know, many, many um, areas tend to be affected, not just one area. Um, patients in our and other centers have been described to have limited disease involving only the oral cavity. In addition, we've noted that the oral cavity can be the site of persistent activity after resolution of chronic GVHD affecting other sites. So this really can be sort of the first, um, the middle, and sort of the last um, area of involvement. And sometimes it might be the only area of involvement. I know you have handouts, and I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail. Um, this was a this was a a, a figure that we had um, published a few years ago in this in this review article, but we can sort of think of as I've already sort of outlined. We can sort of think of the disease in the mouth as three different diseases. One is the the disease affecting the mucosa, and the primary symptom with that tends to be what we call sensitivity. So even with one of these mouths that I showed you that look like they would have to be incredibly painful. If it were me, I would actually be fine right now talking if my mouth weren't dry. Um, and I, I wouldn't necessarily have a dry mouth just because of the inflammation. Um, but as soon as I went to have breakfast, you know, if I tried to eat those potatoes, I'd probably go from being as comfortable as possible to you know tears coming out of my eyes just because of the texture, let alone the flavor, the little bit of um, you know spice. Um, and things that we would never even think would bother somebody immediately can become something that they, they just can't even tolerate. So the idea of you know, going out to dinner, let alone having someone else cook for you, going to somebody's house for a dinner, um, you know, ends up becoming really um, very difficult. Uh, with the salivary gland uh, disease, it's much more the, the dry mouth, the problem with um, increased risk of cavities. With a dry mouth, there's also increased risk of recurrent um, yeast infections in the mouth. And um, I think many of you know that's a, you know, a common complication also related to just systemic immunosuppression. Um, but some of the symptoms can be similar. So sometimes when somebody just has a very dry mouth, the mouth can actually become very sensitive, even though we don't see the typical um, lichenoid sort of lacy inflammation patterns. Uh, and then with the, with the sclerotic or the scleroderma um, form, this is generally you know, tightness, difficulty opening the mouth, um, difficulty being able to sort of just do normal things like brush or, you know, receive dental care. Um, in rare cases, I've seen patients where similar we can see with the skin where there can actually be sort of, um, you know, uh, deep inflammation into the, into the muscle and sort of chronic um, spasm of muscles, which can be very painful. But again, this is not very common. So with the mucosal disease, again, that lichenoid pattern of inflammation is really classic. Um, the cheeks and the tongue are most common. Lips are very, really frequently affected. Again, the, the sensitivity tends to be the, the main feature. Um, this affects eating and drinking, in particular um, toothbrushing. Um, simply using a children's toothpaste rather than an adult toothpaste for most patients is enough to make things comfortable. So as long as there's not a minty flavor or any sort of real strong flavor, there's also you know, adult um, formulated toothpaste like the biotin toothpaste, some of the Tom's toothpaste. Um, that can also be tolerated well. Um, in some cases, some patients may note that the mouth seems tighter than normal, um, may seem like they can't open it. It's not because there's um, the sclerotic changes like we talked about, but simply those white changes actually make the tissue thicker than normal. And so it actually will restrict opening a little bit. And simply by treating the mouth, if we can treat effectively, it can actually treat that very well. So for managing the mouth, topical steroids, just like the way we treat the skin with topical steroids, um, tends to be um, very effective. We can use gels and we can use solutions. In most cases, especially for the cases I showed you, we would tend to use um, solutions just because they're easier to treat the mouth. You can put it in, you know, just put it all in your mouth, swish around everywhere. Um, we generally recommend upwards of five minutes of swishing because the contact time is really important. Otherwise, it's just going on for a minute and then it gets washed away and then, and then whatever saliva the patient has basically washes everything else away. 
Um, the solution that we typically start with, and I think is used most widely throughout the, this country, is called dexamethasone. Dexamethasone, it's not actually approved for topical use. So this is a, a, a steroid that's provided in a solution form so that somebody who otherwise can't swallow pills, for example, little children, can swallow this nicely flavored medicine. Um, and we repurpose that as a topical agent. Works very well. It's widely available, so basically, no matter where somebody lives, it's very easy to get from the pharmacy. Um, it works well for most patients, but not for all patients. So sometimes we have to go to these other agents um, that I have in, um, in italics. I have them in italics because they require compounding. Um, these are not commercially available. I can't just prescribe clobetazole as an oral solution for somebody. Um, but again, for any of you that are familiar with some of these names or have treated skin disease, um, you know, we use generally the same medications for different areas. Um, for the skin, we have many formulations of clobetazole. Um, for the mouth, all we have are, for example, um, a gel formulation, which we can use to treat you know, one area focally. Um, sometimes I'll use gauze to you know, maybe um, treat an ulcer very specifically. Um, but even that is usually in combination with doing a rinse um, as well. Tacrolimus is um, also available topically. Um, there's a, a commercial formulation called Protopic. Some of you, again, may be familiar with this if you've treated the skin. Um, and we use that to treat the lips very effectively. Um, the lips are an area that we try to avoid using topical steroids extensively on because it can cause um, irreversible thinning. And the lips are obviously an area that's very sensitive. Um, that can be a problem with the skin. Fortunately, it's not something we typically see in the mouth. So we can actually treat the mouth as aggressively as we need to um, for extended periods of time. Um, on occasion, we'll actually have this compounded into a solution as well. And then the last thing um, to mention is what we call intralesional steroid therapy. And this is actually, this is what's, what we see here. Um, this is actually injecting um, an injectable steroid directly into the area where the inflammation is. And if you can imagine, you know, going back to here, imagine if, if all the patient's symptoms in this case were really focused here. Um, Intralesional steroid therapy, if this is an area in particular that hasn't otherwise responded well to, you know, at least several weeks of intensive topical treatment, um, can work very, very well. So I basically, the idea is I'm injecting, you know, just next to this ulcer, delivering the, the steroid right to the area. Um, and I have many patients that just require this on an ongoing basis, but manages the, the condition very well. And so these are some examples of treatment before and after. Here's somebody before they've started doing rinses, after doing the rinses, um, you know, they had a sense of tightness, some discomfort. Now their symptoms are significantly improved. Um, similarly, you can imagine these, this lip would be very uncomfortable, you know, anytime anything's touching it. Um, and this is after a few weeks of treatment with uh, topical tacrolimus, and you can see how well it can respond. Um, Really, the, the, the primary complication that we see when we're treating the mouth, especially using topical steroids, is the risk of developing a secondary um, yeast infection or thrush or candidiasis. Um, use of a topical steroid increases the risk because it locally suppresses the immune system in the mouth. Um, patients who are also on systemic immunosuppressive therapy, it's sort of an additive effect, so they're already at risk to some extent. To some extent. And then if the salivary, um, salivary glands aren't functioning completely normally, it's potentially another contributing factor. So this is a fairly common complication, but one that we can actually treat very easily, um, in most cases actually prevent from developing once it's happened. Candidiasis, I mean, I, I, I mentioned these already. The other, the, other, the other potential risk factor is if somebody has a removable denture, that can also contribute to um, the risk of the infection coming back. So disinfecting the denture on a regular basis can be very important, making sure that it's out at night. Um, management is with antifungal therapy. We have topical and systemic agents. I tend to favor systemic agents. There's always some potential interactions um, depending on what systemic medication somebody's on, but especially with, um, uh, especially with fluconazole, which is the most commonly used systemic uh, antifungal agent. That risk is relatively small, and it's something that we can monitor. Um, for the prevention, in most cases, I can have somebody on a once a week dose, sometimes twice a week, and that once or twice a week dose will not typically have a significant impact on interacting with other medications, but it can be very effective in keeping from the infection from coming back. Um, 
and this is something that, you know, once I have a patient who's had, you know, thrush come back a couple of times, we'll pretty much go to a, to a prophylaxis. The other infection that's, that's fairly common in, you know, patients after transplant is um, herpes simplex virus. So this is, you know, um, herpes cold sores that, um, you know, I think most people are, are aware of. Um, the primary risk factor is immunosuppression. So, you know, most patients, when even, even, um, even fairly young patients, you know, this is an infection that most people are exposed to in childhood, um, teenage, early adulthood. Um, by the time we're 50, 60 years old, the overwhelming majority of the population is, has been exposed to this virus. Once you're exposed, you have it forever. It can reactivate under certain conditions, usually um, stress, but in particular, um, suppression of the immune system. And important to remember that, you know, for somebody who's taking their acyclovir regularly, which is supposed to suppress this, we can still, if there's enough um, suppression otherwise, get what's called a, a breakthrough infection. So, um, you know, you're taking the medicine, but you still develop an infection, and so we have to go up to a higher um, dose of medication or potentially change the medication. And so it's, you know, it's not always the easiest diagnosis to make, especially when somebody has generalized graft-first-host disease changes. But once, if somebody develops sort of fairly acute onset, really, really painful symptoms, especially just painful at rest, um, you know, there's a little ulcer here, it's an ulcer here, it probably looks very subtle to you, but very painful for this patient, and also this sort of funny irregular ulcer here um, on the um, inner, inner aspect of the lip without sort of any typical associated um, bite changes like we talked about before. Salivary gland disease, um, so the important things to realize is, is that you know, saliva isn't purely just water. I think we tend to think of it that way. It you know, feels like, okay, we have, we have wetness in our mouth. But saliva, and I'm not gonna go through this, you have this in your, in your slides. It's a, somewhat of a technical table, but it talks about you know, all the various properties and the components of the saliva. So it, it provides lubrication, it has antimicrobial, it actually controls bacteria and fungus in the mouth. Um, there's growth factors, you know, various um, um, proteins in the saliva that we don't even really understand exactly what it does. Plays a role in sort of maintaining mucosal integrity. Plays actually an important role in maintaining the health of the teeth. Um, has these what are called buffering capacities and um, actually remineralization. So that just like bone, the teeth are sort of in this constant flux of being sort of broken down and built back up. Um, and importantly, like I mentioned earlier, there's potentially not just that there's not enough saliva, but the composition has changed. So in some cases, a patient may not even notice that the mouth feels dry, and yet over a period of time, we may actually start to see changes where we can see that there's cavities developing. Um, typical symptoms are gonna be dry mouth, you know, some, some discomfort, sometimes difficulty eating and swallowing just because saliva plays an important role in being able to sort of chew up food and swallow food. Um, but what I'll show you in the next slide, and what we're most concerned about is the risk of um, caries, dental cavities developing, and they tend to follow a fairly um, distinct pattern. Areas where sort of food and debris would tend to collect like along the gum lines and in between the teeth. Um, and then again, this is an important factor for recurrent um, yeast infections in the mouth. So what you see here is very early changes, but you can see it has this almost like a frosted appearance along the gum line. And this is what demineralization looks like. So even though there aren't actual cavities formed at this point, the, the, um, the hard tissue is actually very undermined. Um, and this is after just not a very long, unfortunately, period of time where we can see the progression of, um, of this to the actual cavity. Um, cavities will tend to have this sort of yellowish, brownish appearance. Um, and with an instrument, this would be very soft. Um, and then this is, again, typical pattern. These are um, more advanced uh, um, uh, cavities at this point. But this very typical pattern of along the gum line and with almost all the teeth being affected. So, you know, obviously we want to be able to intervene at a point before this. But even if it's at this point, it's still a time at which as long as the teeth are salvageable, you know, we want to be aggressive and go in there and treat the teeth and, um, and try and prevent sort of any further advancement. So we have ways to treat the, um, the salivary gland disease from sort of a symptomatic standpoint. Um, there's actually some medications that can help um, stimulate the saliva, but you know, making sure that there's just good hydration. Um, things like just sugar-free chewing gum or candy can help just keep the saliva flowing. Um, brushing and flossing, 
Um, having a diet that doesn't promote uh, dental caries is important. Avoiding you know, sugary foods, sticky foods. Um, use of fluoride, both um, sometimes being applied at the office, like something like fluoride varnish, but also prescription fluoride at home. Um, we always struggle a little bit about how much to push this on sort of all transplant survivors because we know that not every patient's at the same level of risk and it's difficult to sort of keep up with all of these sort of preventive um, uh, you know, instructions that you're given. But for somebody who has significant dry mouth symptoms, um, any evidence that there have been changes already with the teeth, we obviously um, you know, really reinforce this. Simply seeing the dentist on a regular basis um, bite wing radiographs for screening. So these are um, this is a bite wing radiograph. This is you know unfortunately showing a lot of dental disease. This is this is all decay that we're looking at. But we can do these you know early on, six months, twelve months after transplant. And if we actually see someone who's starting to develop cavities, we know this is someone that we need to pay, pay more attention to. This is just um, one slide, just to talk briefly about um, the changes that can affect the mouth when it becomes sort of um, tight or fibrous fibrosed. Um, so here, here what you're looking at is a patient who's had previously actually very active graft-versus-host disease in the mouth. They would have had, you know, sores, ulcers like we saw before. Now it's all resolved, but in the areas where it was very active, there are these very tight, like, bands of fibrosis. And it's making, the, making opening difficult, and when they open, it sort of pulls in these areas, it becomes very uncomfortable. Um, and so the reduced mouth opening can actually be because of these types of bands forming inside the mouth or because of changes around the skin on the outside. Um, and this can lead to very localized changes around the gums, um, gums and teeth. Um, we've seen some, you know, some areas of very severe recession, um, sometimes actual um, sores and ulcers just due to the actual sort of um, tightness but, but pulling of the tissue. Um, for somebody who potentially um, would be wearing a denture, the, the sort of the, what we call the vestibule or the gutter space will tend to sort of get lost because the tissue gets tighter, and so it can become very difficult to be able to place a denture. Um, management is really, it's challenging. We have some physical therapy type approaches, sometimes um, surgical approaches, but fortunately this is not a common complication. And the last thing I want to talk about briefly, um, which I mentioned in the beginning, is the increased risk of cancer in the mouth. Um, we know that it, it, there's a significant association with both chronic graft host disease um, and also specifically chronic graft host disease in the mouth. But patients who have not had chronic graft host disease in the mouth are still going to be at risk for potentially developing um, cancer in the mouth at, at some point after transplant. And the important thing to understand is, is this tends to be a late complication many years after transplant. Um, and as far as we understand, this risk actually never goes down. It just sort of continues to go up. So again, overall, the risk is still very low. You know, no one should think that they're at high risk of developing cancer in the mouth, but it is something that we have to sort of have our, our alerts up on. And in most cases, it should look very different from the way chronic graft host disease looks. Even when there's still active chronic graft host disease, there should be something distinct about um, the changes that are that are related to cancer. So, you know, here you can see there's sort of this, this sort of ill-defined red and white sort of mass um, along the you know along the tissue. This um, is very distinct. It's raised. It has sort of a um, a funny pattern uh, texture to it. Um, it's white. So yeah, you could say graft-versus-host disease looks white, but this looks very different. It's again, it's very distinct. Um, similarly here, very distinct, um, deep ulcer with very firm surrounding, surrounding borders. You know, graft versus host disease, the tissue should always feel soft. There's not going to be this firmness around, around an ulcer. Similarly here, you know, very, very well-defined ulcerative lesion sort of extending sort of deep into that pocket between the, the teeth and the gums, um, but without any other changes that look like graft versus host disease in the surrounding area. So I'm going to wrap up, and then we've got time for our questions. Um, as I had said, we, you know, the way we started out, graft host disease in the mouth is common, maybe the first place, maybe the last place of involvement, wide range of symptoms. Um, we have some you know, fairly standard approaches to management. There's some very simple things, like avoiding things that would um, be bothersome. There's you know, active treatments. 
um, for both um, treating the mucosal disease as well as for treating the salivary gland um, disease and symptoms. Um, the importance of seeing a dentist regularly um, as soon as ideally six months after transplant, ideally that's about, that is a, in a, a good time and it's important to return to the dentist, assuming there aren't other complicating factors um, that would keep someone from going. And then um, the oral cancer surveillance, and I think it's important for you know, patients to be aware. So you know, a patient knows their mouth in most cases better than anyone else. They know what things feel like, they know what's normal. If something just doesn't seem normal, um, want to make sure that you know, they let someone know. These next few slides, I'm not going to go through. I just have this sort of as a resource. Um, these are some of the more common prescriptions, and just it might be helpful depending on you know, how and where um, you're being managed. This is a table um, that we just reproduced from our publication that just talks about some of these potential late complications and some of our sort of recommended sort of guidelines for screening, prevention, management. And then um, you've probably seen this slide previously, but there's a number of other resources, including um, this book, which um, you know, I played a role in in sort of um, providing some review and material for. So this talks about graft host disease in the mouth a little bit. There's some other good resources. And we'll stop there. And we have, I think, what, 25 minutes for questions. So. Thank you, Dr. Yes, Schmister. Yes. And we're just and opening the floor to questions. And if we ask that you could speak to the mic, and if you can't get to the mic, we can bring the mic to you. So, so very good question. Um, so I, I try to serve as a resource, and obviously we you know, try and put materials together like this and um, you know, publish materials and so on. The reality is, is, is you're probably aware, most dentists will not know a whole lot about stem cell transplantation. My hope would be is that especially once they have a patient, that they take that opportunity to spend a little bit of time and seek out some resources. So for example, I believe that paper that I referenced a couple times is like anyone could go to you know Google it, look it up, and download it because it's it's available you know open. Um, but I think you know as long as they have a way to communicate back to the transplant center and there's some information being provided, you know every center works a little bit differently. Most centers unfortunately don't have at least as strong of an oral health resource as we do. Um, but obviously, you know, we have resources. We have resources on our website. Um, I would even say, you know, someone could certainly come to our website even just to look for those resources. Um, but the reality is, you know, for the most part, the dental aspect of things, it's really like the basic principles of dentistry don't change because you or somebody's had a transplant. Um, you know, some things may sort of seem a little bit different. Like, you know, I haven't had a patient who's had this problem with such dry mouth before and this problem with cavities, but reality is maybe they have, because I mentioned you know, this condition, Sjogren's syndrome. It's a fairly common autoimmune disease, so you know, we do see other, sometimes you know, there's, there's other cancer therapies that can result in um, sort of a similar situation. So somebody who's been treated for head and neck cancer, I mean, not to talk about more cancers, but you know, someone who's had radiation therapy, they oftentimes have as, you know, as similar, but even worse um, complications related to salivary changes. So it's a long-winded answer to, to that there are resources out there, and I would hope that you know, they understand and sort of seek that out and or you know, reach out to, you know, to look for it. No, it's not necessary. So that, there's, there's no reason to be replacing metal fillings unless they're actually breaking down. So anyone who's heard anything about anything related to, you know, from you know, cancer to... Um, I don't even know what conditions have been associated, but dent silver fillings in the mouth are safe. They don't need to be replaced. Um, oftentimes, they would still be our filling of choice, you know, the, the, the material of choice, depending on sort of the where and the what of, of what's being restored. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is when it comes to managing the, uh, not the teeth, but the actual like mucosal disease, you know, the sores, Unfortunately, that is also an area where most dentists just don't have most of the, even just the, the basic education and experience in managing um, mucosal conditions. Doesn't mean that they're not capable. And again, you know, for the most part, most of what we do to manage this, I mean, it's, it's not really, really high level complex medicine. It's just understanding sort of how to connect the dots and, you know, explain to someone what to do effectively. So um, again, I mean, there's resources out there. 
they can be prescribing. You know, you want to make sure that you know somebody is is hopefully you know paying attention. So, email. So, yeah, I mean, one thing I would say is, is I, I try to make myself as available as possible, just because there aren't that many resources like me. Um, by all means, if somebody gets you know has a way to get a hold of me, I'm happy to to receive emails. But also, you know, I make myself available through the BMT Infinite. So, probably four or five times a year, we I get a question that's directed. You know, it's come through whatever the portal is to BMT InfoNet and then to me. So it's, it's kind of a nice way of doing it because I think that way they know also that you know, they're serving as that sort of clearinghouse resource at least. So it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, depending on where you live in Colorado, my guess would be is that, the, it, what's that? Yeah, I, it's, yeah, it, the, you're probably not going to find a dentist who, like, specifically. I mean, you're not going to find someone that has, you know, my type of training, for example, you know, oral medicine training, out in anywhere except for Denver. And even in Denver, there's you know one or two people. So it's it, these there's there's not a lot out there. Um, again, they should be comfortable with you know the basic management of things, and at least. The, the more basic um, aspects of managing the dry mouth uh, aspect of things and or working together with the transplant team. So for example, one of the medications, I didn't, I didn't um, it's, it's on the list, but I didn't talk about specifically when I talked about what are called sialagogues, but some of you may be aware of these. There's two medications we have available. Um, one is called pilocarpine and the other one is called civimeline. And these basically stimulate the salivary glands to produce more saliva. They're not immunosuppressive. So it's not like you're adding on another immunosuppressive medication. It's just doing a very specific you know, action. Um, sometimes that could be prescribed by a dentist. It could, be or it could be prescribed by a primary care physician. Or it could be prescribed by a transplant physician. Probably more often than not, in the transplant world, it's going to be prescribed by the transplant physician. Whereas at our center, you know, our, our team is generally writing those prescriptions. But a dentist can write a prescription for that. So even as a, like a patient being an advocate, you could say, you know, I was at this talk and I've heard about this medication, pilocarpine, and they would say, oh yeah, you know, I've never even prescribed it before, but it seems reasonable and, uh, you know, let's give it a try. I mean, there's nothing that will actually stretch it like that. I mean, obviously, I mean, I think, you know, basic trick is at least putting some Vaseline to make it more comfortable. Um, also, um, depending on like what is being done, the length of the procedure, there's something called a bite block that can just make it a lot more comfortable for you. So even if it's not opening it wider, it's, it's easier to keep it open for longer. So it's like just a little triangular piece of rubber that goes between the teeth and kind of holds things open. But if it's really limited and it's, you know, like for instance, you were able to open a certain amount to you know, eat or do something and now it's, it's becoming difficult, there's, you know, there's some simple sort of stretching exercises. There's, you know, sometimes, you know, people do just something as simple as using, you know, tongue depressors, popsicle sticks, and sort of, you know, stacking them and sort of adding them in between to get a certain opening. Um, there are some physical therapy devices too. I didn't go into any detail. We don't use them very often, but um, there's actually devices that are, you know, like bioengineered to open the mouth. Right? But again, n most of these treatments, I mean, they're, we don't have, we don't have, you know, big studies demonstrating you know, who's going to benefit, who's not going to benefit. So, so you probably don't want to hear this, but there's no substitute for brushing. So if, if that's really what you're trying to accomplish, and I would say for anyone, I mean, for any of my patients, especially that I really feel are at risk for um, the dental problems, it's try to brush after every meal. Even if you're doing a somewhat of a cursory brushing and you know that you spend longer you know, in the morning and at night, you're still doing something. So brushing, there's no substitute. Um, other than that, there's, you know, a rinse, if, if the mouth is, you know, really dry and sort of food tends to collect, then certainly a rinse would be 